Sections here love me. Sections here love me. The no love section. I shun you. I shun you. I shun you. Get the backside today. Mark, high, high, high grades for 30, how many years of marriage? 39. Low marks about talking about your ex-girlfriends. No bueno. As we can see, your wife's not here this service. Hmm. Hmm. Coincidence? I think not. We are in a, we are in a, uh, I don't know where we are. Where, where, where are we? Fresno. I didn't know anybody still lived in Fresno. I, I, just, I drove through it once. It was like, hmm, oh, sorry. Anybody from Fresno? I, I'm sure you're, yeah, I knew it'd be over here, right? It's like another reason for you to represent that whole section to be mad at me. All right, give me a t-shirt, I'll wear it, I promise. Excel. We're in a series talking about transitions and, uh, you know, some transitions you dread. You know, you do. Uh, I've seen people at the end of their life and I've seen people holding on terrified of entering into eternity. And I've seen other people that have prepared themselves well for eternity and just with nothing but joy and almost like, just pull the plug and get me out of here. I mean, so much joy, so much peace, so much God, you know. Uh, so transitions, if they're walked with, with God, can be good. And we're in a transition right now. I've been in this transition for two years. It's not a day too late, and it's not a day too song too soon. It's just right. Everybody say, just right. And it's good. And so we're celebrating. We're celebrating. Last week, Pastor Francis did a phenomenal job of talking about the generational blessing. And even they liked it over there. Um, if you weren't here last week, uh, you need to watch it online. How many of you weren't here last week? Can I see your hands? Where were you? Just... Oh, well, you, you turned red. It couldn't have been a good place. Got, got a little vinegar in me today or something. <laughs> so we're talking about transitions, and this one's a good one because it's God-ordained. And I want to talk about seasons. I want to talk about transitions. I want to talk about necessary endings, necessary transitions. Think about what Jesus said. It's necessary that I go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. Now, Jesus said it, so he's saying there is something God wants to do in the new and the next that's not going to happen unless I go away. And I would say the same thing is true for all of us in here. It's true for the church. Whatever reason at this time frame in the Rock's history at 21 years, God is saying there's a new season, there's a new thing, there's a new transition, there's something that God wants to do that's not going to be done with Pastor Francis. And I would also say that the same goes for Pastor Francis and Susie. There is something new, and I'm really excited about it because it's not retirement. We don't use that language here. Uh, it is transition. It is the new thing that God is going to do in them and through them. I'm totally excited with them. I golf with them every week. I let them win most of the time. Um, it's all good. And they're excited, and I'm excited. I'm excited for our future at The Rock. I celebrate and I honor our past. I've been here 12 and a half years. I celebrate and honor everything God's done here. Uh, I celebrate what I know about that has gone on, you know, before I got here. Uh, I, and I'm celebrating what God's going to do because I think, God, there's a new thing that God's doing and he's going to do and it's going to be good. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8. So I just want to massage this. I'm the bridge guy. You know, we've got the history of the rock. We've got Pastor Francis, my friend. We've got where we're at now, transition. We've got Pastor Brandon, who is going to take the baton. Not yet, but next week right here. And I get to be the middle guy. I love being the middle guy most of the time. It's good. I get to, I get to do this right here. Hand off. It's going to be good. Look at this verse here. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning of it. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Don't say, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise or because of wisdom that you ask this. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Why is that true? Because at the end of a thing, there's always a next thing. At the end of something, there's always a new thing. And with God, that's 
always true. Transitions are always good. How many of you know that God always leads you away from something into something that's better? Always. I'm going to go through some scriptures in a while, but that's always true. And here's, here's what transition means here. The process or a period of changing from one state or condition to another. I mean, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, look, all things become new. That's, that's transition. Uh, change, metamorphosis, movement. These are all synonyms for transition. These are things that you and I, by the grace of God, will be perpetually going through until the day we die. Unfortunately, you know, we, we normalize stuckness. We normalize non-newness of life. We normalize stagnation. Let me ask you something. Are you aware of the new thing that God is doing in you? Are you aware of the new thing God wants to do? Or if somebody were to ask you, what is God doing? You'd go, ah, you know, I don't know. I go to church and read my Bible a little bit. You know, can you put your finger on what God's saying to you? Do you think God still speaks? Do you think he's a past tense God? They go, oh, yeah I, did, yeah, I did some great things back then, and it's great history. Or do you believe that God is the God of now? I believe that he's still, still speaking. I believe that his word in Hebrews is true for today. Today, if you will hear my voice, today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, today, if you will hear my voice, what the Spirit of God is saying. If you haven't heard from God in a long time, it's not because he doesn't want to speak to you. It's because you might not be inclining your ear or it might be because you're not willing to leave some of the things that, that, that create noise up here, noise here. He speaks in a still, small voice. And he's not about to yell because you and I are distracted or preoccupied with other things. You've got to say no. You've got to move away. You've got to leave. You've got to dial in. Why did Jesus say, go into a room by yourself? Is there something sacred about a room? No, it's because in a room there's no distractions. Go in by yourself. He's got something to say to you. He's got something to say to us. He has something to say about our church right here. Transitions. They're normal. Throughout Scripture, transitions are normal. I mean, think about the words used to describe followers of God, followers of Christ. Here's the words that that the Bible uses for us. We're called pilgrims. Pilgrims, sojourners, aliens, foreigners, people of the dispersion, wanderers. Now, now, now just think about that. That's the norm. The norm is transitory people that don't really have a home. You know, Jesus said foxes have holes, birds have air, nests, but, you know, son of man doesn't have... What he was saying was, don't think permanency. This isn't your home. You're a citizen of heaven. You're otherworldly. The the American dream doesn't cohabitate with the transitions of God. Thank you, thank you. (laughs) I'm not even looking over there anymore. You're so done. Don't normalize stuckness, non-newness of life. Think about this. Picture of Anthony and Anu, great friends of ours. We sent them out a year and a half ago. You know, they, these are people, Anthony on the right, Anu on the left. Uh, you know, these are dear friends. We've spent a lot of time together, drank a lot of coffee, ate a lot of meals together. Um, and they'll be straight up honest with you. And they'll say, Roseville was hard to leave. It's a hard place to leave. It was comfortable. There's a lot of great restaurants. There's a gr- lot of great people. I love our, we love our home church. You know, going to India is hard. And if you haven't been to India, let me just tell you, India is hard. It is hard on every system in you. Leave it at that. It's just real. I'm just being real. Not easy. Difficult. So here they are, 7,500 miles away from home, and two days ago led this family to Jesus. Is leaving, is leaving Roseville with all its comfort and ease and going halfway around the planet worth that family coming to Jesus? Is it worth it? Okay. 
And of course, he sent me a text and said, hey, got you signed up for March 1st for a few meetings. And in India, that means four or five a day for as long as you're there. And they'll just, they don't care. They'll just ring you out, wear you out. You know, God bless you. See you. Come again. Um, next, next slide. Okay, so this is Greece. Uh, this is a family right here. Uh, dad is in Iraq. Family's here or in Greece. The mom died of cancer a few months ago. The guy in the red shirt, um, 23 years of age, uh, had the privilege of leading him to Jesus. Um, you know, I mean, think about this. And so he's 23. Now he's the head of his household. He's got a brother that's like 20, another one that's 18 or 17, uh, a sister that's 16, another sister that's 14, and they're on their own. And they could go back to Iraq, but the dad says, no, 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 it's too messed up. It's too, it, it, there's too much war. Just stay there. So they're there, and they live in an apartment, next slide, uh, you know, that the government gives them. But there's nothing there. Those are bare bone beds. They got nothing, no furniture. Uh, they're happy to be alive. They love Jesus. And we gave them, uh, each of the girls, we gave $200 to buy clothes. Each of the guys, we gave $100, and they went shopping. And they were pretty excited about that. The guy on the left there. Uh, is a guy that left with his uh, wife and two or three kids. I can't remember if the, the youngest was born yet. Uh, left Iraq, uh, had a home that was blown up that was right next to a hospital. An eight-year-old girl died. Uh, he loves Jesus. Him and his family walked 44 days through the desert to try to find their way, way to a place where they could get on a boat uh, and come to Greece. Uh, he has led 20 Muslims to Christ in 10 days, baptized every single one of them. <laughs> baptized every single one of them, and that week, every single one of those people got a text saying that their family was gonna be killed. That, that's real, that's what's going on, you know? And you know, the thought is, well, do you feel sorry for them? No, I feel responsible for them. And I believe we have a responsibility and let me just tell you this, that the narrative you get on the news about refugees is not the reality of when you talk to them face to face. So what I would say most of what you hear on the news is garbage. Well, that's just true anyways. But when it comes to the refugee deal, you need to talk and you need to hear stories. And when you got people that look you in the eye and they had family members blown up and they don't want to be where they're at and they're trying to get somewhere safe and they get dropped in a new country and they don't speak the language and you got kids in diapers and you don't have any money and you don't know who to talk to and there's no resources and there's no agencies and you're flat out stuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's true. Now, here's the deal. In transitions, there's good ones, hard ones, bad ones, and I've seen it all. Church life, oh, there's brutal, tr brutal transitions, hostile takeovers, church splits, unbelievable. There's a church in my area up in Washington. Uh, they got the new pastor in. Elders stood up, started saying a bunch of stuff. They carried the dude out. <laughs> He raised some objections about everything, and they, they, you know, the bodyguards put the dude, <laughs> dragged the little elder out. <laughs> That's sad. Why am I smiling? It's just, it's that sad. <laughs> Didn't go well. Church doesn't exist today. Gee, shock. Wonder why. Hard transitions. You know, part of, part of my responsibility with the denomination that I was with up in Washington was a district supervisor, which meant that I oversaw 28 churches. Most of them not doing really well. A few of them doing real. Some of them really messed up. So, man, I had my little business card. Bob Hasty, district supervisor. Awesome. Felt like somebody. But then you had to walk into the messes of some churches, the ungodliness, the carnality of some churches. There was, the, there was a transition that I instigated where I closed a church down. There was a church, and it was a mess. And it was a mean church, and it was angry, and it had a bad reputation. And there was about 30 or 40 people, man, and Jesus was nowhere in sight. So I called their elders, had a meeting, and I said, I'm going to come up, and I'm going to close the church down. And they said, what? I said, yep. So go tell the people, I'm coming. Two Sundays, closing it down, let's have a meeting. So I brought Mexican food. <laughs> 
I don't know why, but I brought it. And so I went up and I said, hey, here's what's going on. We're, we're closing this church. And man, they started, you know, how dare you, bureaucrat, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they just went off, teed off. And I listened and ate chips and salsa. <laughs> and listened and listened. And they were mad and they were angry. And they were like, ah, ah, ah. And then I just stopped. I said, you done? Because I got something to say. Let me tell you your reputation in the community. You are the angry church. You're the mean church. You're the intolerant church. You're the church that doesn't get along with anybody. You're the church that doesn't love people. That's your reputation. That's the only thing I hear about this church. So you know what? It's not going to be a church under my watch. It's not going to be in our denomination. And I said, make no mistake. I love humble pie. If this is the wrong decision, I will eat all the humble pie. You can serve me. But you know how I know this is the right decision? Because when I made this decision, I put my head on my pillow and I slept like a baby. And that's how I know it's right. And I said, if it's wrong, I will come back and I will repent to every single one of you. But I know it's not wrong. And we prayed and packed my (laughs) U-Haul. Why'd you come to California? (laughs) Dodging arrows, man. (laughs) One one transition took place this way. (laughs) This was in my area, not under my stewardship, but... The pastor left a resignation on the pulpit. (laughs) I mean, unbelievable. You know, church coming, we're going to love Jesus today. What's that? Hey, there's a note up there. I hereby resign immediately. Goodbye. (laughs) The U-Haul was going down the road, man. It was like, (laughs) bad transition, hard transition. This is a good transition. You know why this is a good transition? Because it's bathed in prayer. Bathed in prayer. Didn't make decisions, but discerned the will of God. I mean, there is Francis hearing from God on the day and the season, and it seemed right to the Holy Spirit and to us. And Pastor Brandon is not chomping at the bit, give me the baton, because he knows what's coming. He's going, what meaneth this? (laughs) You'll find out soon enough, son. (laughs) Pastoring's hard. Being a shepherd's hard. Sheep bite sometimes. (laughs) Not even joking. They're over there. (laughs) So let's talk about seasons a little bit. Because we're in one, and you're in one. And you're either coming out of one, or you're going into one. And as a church, we're in this season, this great season. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. You've never heard these verses before. (laughs) How many have been in a Hallmark shop? Okay, you've heard these verses. To everything, there's a season. And there was a great song in the 60s by the birds. Actually, I think they were called the yard birds. No? The birds, not the yard birds? I'll Google fact check you. We'll get back to you next week. It's a great song, though. And it was based on these verses here. Everything, there's a season. Time, purpose for under heaven. Time to be born, a time to die. Time to plant, time to pluck what is planted. Time to kill, a time to heal. Time to break down, a time to build up. Time to weep, time to laugh, time to mourn, and a time to dance. In all those verses, there's 14 different transitions that you and I are all going to be a part of. I mean, you don't go through life in a non-transitory way. You transition emotionally and spiritually and physically. And in every way, your family dynamics change. Your relational dynamics change. Your friends, everything, everything transitions. Everything changes. And I have found that when I cooperate with the season, it goes well. When I resist the season... It goes bad. Cooperate with the season. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, you love summer? Summertime. Love summer. All the heat. I love the long days. Love the dog days of summer. Love the summer. How many of you love fall? You love fall, which means you love Apple Hill. Can we go to Apple Hill? 
I mean, come on, man. You've seen one apple pie. You've seen them all. I mean, it's like, okay, there's ducks right there. Yep, those are ducks. There's an apple. Uh Uh-huh. Let's go to Apple Hill. Been delivered. Thank you, Jesus. It's true. Apple Hill. Whatever, man. I come from the Apple State, Washington. You're going to give me a couple little farms up there. and like, oh, here's our apple farms. <laughs> However, if you have small kids, I get it. I understand. <laughs> Fine. Here's the deal about seasons. They're sovereign, and God set them in place. So if God set your season in place, don't resist it, and don't rush it. You know, you ever find yourself in a bad season and you go, I just want to get to the next season. No, 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 no. When you're in winter, let winter have its work in you. When you're in spring, let spring have its work in you. How many of you like spring? You're spring people. All right, yeah. Be present in the season that God has you in because there's a work that God wants to do that he's only going to do in that season. You know, in winter, you know, winter is the time where there's a lot of barrenness. There's no leaves on the tree. There's no fruit. There, there's a lot of, you know, kind of ice, desolation, loneliness. It's where you prune. It's where there's death. It's where not much is happening. But that can be an important season because that's when roots go deep, and that's where you rest. That's where the, that's where the trees rest and get ready to start producing again. But I would also say, you know, that when you're in one of those seasons, be careful about who you hang out with. Because if you're in a winter season, you don't want to be around a summer season person. You know, you're in this barrenness, and, you you know, the voice of God is just like, where are you, God? And I'm looking, and there's no fruit, and there's like, you know, this desolation. You come, come along, and there's somebody in a summer season, and it's like, wow, this is awesome, man. Blossoms, and everything's blooming, and it's good. It's like, you know, you got to stay away from those people, man. They'll, it's like, whoa. You find your other winter friends. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Oh, man, not much going on. Me neither, man. Let's talk about this. This is... Let's have some coffee, yeah. (laughs) Read the Bible lately? Nope. Heard God's voice? Nope. You care about God? Nope. Care about people? Nope. It's bad, I know. Let's talk. Stay away from summer person over there, (laughs) because... So seasons are sovereign. How you prepare for a season... The reason this season... For the rock is celebratory is because the right preparation has taken place. There's been prayer. There's been counsel. There's been wisdom that sought it. We looked at people, churches that transitioned well, and it went good, and there was the right appropriate honoring that went on. And we learned from churches that didn't do well, that transitioned poorly, misrepresented the heart of God, didn't end well. So we've prayed more. We've talked. We've dialogued. There's peace. There's wisdom that comes from above. Peaceable, gentle, easily entreated. And there's this agreement on the inside of all the leaders and the elders. And it's good. Because there's been preparation. Remember, I went to Chicago in February one time. And I've always prided myself in being warm-blooded from Seattle. I just, you know, it's just not cold anywhere. And I went to Chicago in February. Didn't even look at the weather thing. Didn't even look. I just, well, I'm warm blood. It doesn't matter. So I go back there. I got my little sweats on, not lined, got a little light jacket on. We're flying in. I'm seeing mounds of snow. And it's like, ooh, this might not be good. Pilot comes on. It's like, welcome to Chicago O'Hare International Airport. It's seven degrees out. <clears throat> Winds out of the west at 24 knots. And I'm thinking, oh, And I got out of that airport, and I'm telling you, for three days, I absolutely froze. Froze. I wasn't prepared for it. Isn't it interesting how somebody can go into a snowstorm, and if they're not prepared, it's miserable, and they can die of hypothermia? But if somebody's prepared, they can take some of the best pictures on the planet. It's all about how you're prepared. If you're prepared for the season that God has you in, it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be redemptive, and it's going to be full of joy. And that's the season that we're in right here and right now, and we're all a part of it. Don't long for the next season. You know, longing 
for something you don't have access to will train you in discontentment. Don't, don't rush the season, man. It, it, whatever season you're in, don't long. You don't have, a, right now, we don't have access to spring. I don't care how much you like spring. You don't have access to it now, so it would be a complete waste of time. So, oh, I just wish we were spring. Can we hurry up and get to spring? Complete waste of time. Don't long for the next season. Be present now. By faith, embrace the season you're in. Be present. Um, just, you know, once again, you go through Scripture, and it's not isolated. It's, it's the norm. It's the thread throughout Genesis to Revelation about the necessity of leaving things behind, of moving, of transitioning. And here's just a couple of them, you know, Genesis 12. Abraham was instructed to leave his country, his people, and his father's household to go to the land that God would provide so that God could make him into a great nation and that nation would be a blessing to all. Abraham is called the father of our faith. If he doesn't leave, Israel doesn't become a nation. They don't inherit the blessing and they don't give the blessings of God to other people. Had to leave so that... Moses had to leave Egypt so that God's people could have their new identity. From slave, they had to leave from being a slave to sons and daughters of God, the people of God. But they had to leave. You don't leave, you don't get that new identity. So they had to leave. Lot and his family needed to leave Sodom and Gomorrah without looking back so that God could save them from being ruined. In fact, I would say you and I need to have eyes to see and ears to hear what you and I need to leave behind that are getting in the way of a full relationship with Jesus. There is always something. You know, what obvious maybe sin, and Hebrews talks about weights and sins that easily beset you and put them off and get rid of them. But as you mature, what used to not be sin or vice versa can now be. You know, it's something that was like kind of innocuous, you know, whatever. You watch TV, blah, 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 blah. Now all of a sudden God's saying, that, yeah, that's in the way. A little binge watch reality show, that's garbage. Get rid of it. So that. So that. You can have a new relationship with God. Let me, let me tell you something. God is a giver. True? God is a taker. And he wants to take anything from you that's in the way of him relating rightly with you. And there are some places you need to leave, and there are some people you need to leave, and there are some whatever, addictions, infatuations, entertainment, self things. Got to leave it behind. Got to go. If not, what's the alternative? Hey, you try to do both. And then there's just a lack of fulfillment. There's no joy. You're playing both sides against the middle. It's, just, it's, it's not good. It's not healthy. It's not helpful. So, you know, we're celebrating, man. The next week is going to be a celebration, man. But we're celebrating even now. We're celebrating. We're honoring Pastor Francis. I'm not going to look at him so I don't cry. Seriously. I mean, I love this guy. He knows I love him. <clears throat> block them out. Block him out. <laughs> Ever feel like you're just keeping people at a distance? Yes. <laughs> I love this guy. I was thinking, I was reflecting. I know next week is the big hoop de doo and all that stuff, but I was just thinking about what I've seen and what I've experienced. I mean, God told me to leave Washington to go to a place I said I would never go to. Sorry. I just said, I'm never going, I'm never moving to California. Well, now I say I'm never moving to Hawaii. Never. <laughs> Not going. Nope. <laughs> do you believe in reverse psychology? Yep. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so I was thinking about France. I was thinking about, you know, the rock, 21 years of grace, the modeling of transparency. I mean, man, what, you don't know how novel it is for leaders to be transparent. Most of them, you know, a lot of them, got to keep an image up. They don't share their weakness. They don't share their struggle. They don't share their sin because they might be judged. 
That's true. But you, when you've been judged at the cross, you've already been judged. There's only mercy and grace left. So Pastor Francis has modeled transparency and grace. And, you know, he has developed leaders, but more importantly, he's allowed leaders to emerge without being threatened. I tell you, I've seen some insecure leaders, man. And when, when somebody else starts thriving, they get nervous, get insecure. Haven't seen that with Francis. Always rooting for everybody to do better than he did. Always rooted for me. Always rooted for Brandon. No insecure there. Preach good. Preach, preach. Go, go, go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Not everybody does that. Mature leaders do that. Immature leaders don't do that. They make room. They create wins. They give opportunities. They're not threatened. They love. They rejoice when you do good. They suffer when you, with you when you don't do so well. So I think about that. I think about, you know, the whole responding well. I think I heard that message the weekend after I threw my first golf club when I moved down here. <laughs> the respond well. I thought, oh, it's, I'm supposed to live like that? Bob, can't throw golf clubs. Oh, okay. You know, and the humility, you know, the, the humility of Pastor Francis. I mean, that was really one of the first things when we moved down here. Uh, I remember coming down here, not being here long, and he said, hey, can you, can you sit in on a meeting with me? Didn't know what it was about. I said, sure, you know. So I go in there, and uh, there's somebody who was very, very disgruntled, very upset. And, and I just kind of watched. And, and I'm thinking, I'm listening to the grievances, and I'm thinking, just get over it. I mean, it wasn't just not that big a deal, really. I mean, honestly. And then I see Francis come out of his chair, go down on his knee, go to the person sitting in the chair, grab their hand, tears in his eyes. He goes, will you forgive me? Will you please forgive me? And I'm thinking, this is the thought that went through my head. It'd be a cold day in hell before I apologize to them. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that was my thought. I'm just telling you. You don't have to like it. I know, you should be more mature. I know, but I'm just telling you. My thinking, I thought, no. I go home. I go home, walk in the door, LaDonna goes, how was your day? I said, I'm not saved. <laughs> nope. Not saved. I need Jesus. But I learned something that day. It's not exacting out forgiveness for something that was wrong. It's sometimes that's what a person needs to move on, regardless of if they deserve an apology or not. I learned something. It's okay to apologize even if they don't deserve it. I mean, really, it's okay. Being filled with grace and mercy is a good thing. Isn't that who you want to encounter when you screw up? I want that. Grace and mercy and truth. Yeah. Not harsh. And then I was thinking of a summary sentence or verse for Francis and Susie. And this is, this is the one that came to me yesterday. Just praying and meditating and thinking about it. And I was thinking, when Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. And I thought, I think that sums it up right there. Francis and Susie have freely received from God. And they know every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. They know that. They glorify God in that. And so, they also freely give. And I just thought, that does that make sense? Do you, do you agree with that, or do you want another verse? <laughs> <laughs> I think that says it all. You are a man that's blessed by God, and you've received, and you're not stingy, man. You are, you're not, you are generous. Everything, your time, your energy, everything. Now you're retiring, and we're going to go golfing, and you're going to pull the retirement card. And it's like, well, I can't pay. I'm retired. Like, okay. Okay. I let you win, and I have to pay? Oh, my gosh. Let's stand up together. Want to pray? Um, you know... 
if you weren't here last week, seriously, I, I mean it, you should, um, you should watch Pastor Francis' message last week on the uh, generational blessing. It was stellar. It was amazing. It really captured the heart of what God's doing in this church. And um, so I would encourage you to go look at it. Um, We don't believe, and Pastor Brandon doesn't believe, that this is supposed to be a millennial church or a boomer church or a buster, builder, Xer, silent. Did I get them all? Ah, whatever, man. It's like all those. We we really believe that God loves all age groups. He does. He really does. Yeah. He loves old people like me. He does. He loves us. They may not. He does, and I'm good with that. So I would like uh, Aaron Dolce and Fred, would you come on up here? And we're going to have people get around us and pray, and this leg on this thing is about toast, so hopefully it doesn't. Yeah, we are really, uh, Pastor Francis, come on up here. Um, I was on a mission trip uh, a couple years ago. We were having our debrief. There was like 23, 24 people there. And it hit me that there were people in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s that were on this mission trip. And I just remember thinking, that's the heart of God right there. That, that's it. Every age group right there represented. It was awesome. And so here's what I want us to do. I'm going to have Aaron, as a younger man, pray. Pray over Francis. Pray over the church. And have Fred pray over us. And so I would just like to invite whoever just wants to come on up here, just get on up here and let's uh, lay hands on these guys. Because I don't think you can oversaturate in prayer anything, let alone a transition uh, of this magnitude. And then, church, if you would just stretch out your hands, that would be awesome. Good. So let's pray. So, Father, we just... um We're reminded of your goodness by giving us a leader like Francis. So God, we just say thank you. Thank you for uh, the years that uh, this man has really sown into the kingdom and into this church specifically where he could have been spending his time, his money, his energy doing all sorts of other things, but he chose to listen to you and to sow here. Uh, So God, we just ask that he would be shocked by the amount of fruit that comes out of the season. And even um, as, as we were praying for you last service, the Lord kept bringing this to my mind. And I heard him say that the increase of the gifts of the Spirit on yours and Susie's life in this next season is going to shock you. So, Father, we just agree with that. We say yes and amen to that, Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the right words at the right time for the right people. Uh, We thank you for a grace to unite and a grace to even call the body uh, across denominational lines into fasting and prayer for a greater move of God in the region. We just thank you that you're blessing that on his life and on Susie's life, God. And Father, for uh, just us as a church and even as a member of the younger generation, I ask that you would give us a teachable spirit, God, Um, that we would be able to compromise, that everybody would be able to meet in the middle somewhere, and uh, that we would really learn what it means to do what your word says, where we would outdo one another in showing honor. Um, That before anybody has a chance to get offended about anything, we would go low, we would go to the place of honor. Um, So I just pray that you would temper our zeal with wisdom and that you would uh, just remind us that this isn't about what we want from a church, this is about what you want for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. I feel that um, the Lord wants to commend Brandon for his example. The scripture talks about in 1 Timothy 4.12 that let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in lifestyle and and love and all those fruits of the Spirit. And he has demonstrated that, and God wants to commend him for that. At the same time, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says that... uh, don't let a, sp- a spirit of timidity uh, rule over your life. I believe that he has a spirit of faith, not a spirit of timidity. I think he has 
power, which is the grace of God. I think the grace of God is upon him. It's going to continue to be upon him. He has love for even during the hard times. The, the love is going to rule out over other things because the anointing of the God is upon him. He has a disciplined mind. He's going to hear the things of the Spirit, and he's going to be steadfast to do what the Spirit of God wants him to do. And another word I would say is that he is a team member, and he needs to ask at times for input from his other pastors and elders because in a race, there's usually four men or women running, and they work together as a team. So just be open to counsel from those around you who may be more experienced. So, Lord, we thank you for Brandon. We thank you for the qualifications, Lord, that the baton is being passed to him. It's a, it's a God thing, and he's going to run the race with patience. And he's going to be looking to you. The scripture says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So continue to help him to look straight to you during this time and in future years. So bless this transition time, we pray now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. I want to do one more thing before we go. Once again, these are just symbolic moments. They're, they're right moments. It's really important, you know, um, when I left my church, it was really important that the church didn't feel like I was leaving because of anything they did wrong. You know what I mean? So it's just really important to get blessings both ways. So I just want to ask you, as a congregation of the Rock of Roseville, will you give Francis and Susie your blessing to transition with joy and faith and peace. Will you? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You even got that section. That section gave you their blessing. Now, here, just come up here real quick. <laughs> Can't wait for that Fresno shirt. Um, and then let me just ask this, and we already know the answer, but Francis, will you and Susie give your blessing to the Rock of Roseville and all its future seasons? Absolutely. Okay. It's almost like a wedding here. Um, <laughs> I now pronounce you Bob and Francis. Um, it's, it's not that kind of transition right now. You can get away with a lot for another week. Um, why don't you just pray for us? You know, Lord, it is um, just a whole different emotional experience here today, Lord. I love, I love these folks, Lord God. I love what you've done here. I love the leaders. I love the next generation. I love the new folks who are coming in. I love the anticipation. I love the worship today. I love the vision, the, the passion, the life, Lord. So, Lord, whatever I have, God, I think of even that verse today, who is sufficient for these things? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, Lord. And so you have been around for a few transitions, Lord. You've been around for a few generational passes. And, Father, you do all things well, Lord, all things well. So I know that even the grace we've experienced, Lord, it... it um, we made it a long landing, Lord, and uh, we've needed every bit of it, Lord. We've needed the, the long landing of um, preparing our hearts, um, preparing the next generation. And so, Lord, it is good. It just is good. Even as you um, created and you said it, it is good to each step along the way, Lord, you have created this transition, Lord, this handoff. And we, we thank you for Brandon and Rachel and the other leaders who are here. I, I am so pleased by who they are, their humility, their grace, their uh, strength, their vision, their desire to hear from you and not color by the numbers or replicate something else, but to really go up to the mountain themselves and to hear from you. And they have and they are and they will. Uh, even as Rachel got up today and shared a word, and I just commended her because there's a grace on her life. And uh, we we thank you that they both are extraordinarily anointed, as are the leaders, that 
um, you're raising up here, Lord. So we pass on a generational blessing, Lord. Uh, and I would say I was once was young, and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. You're a God of abundance, not lack, Lord. And so I thank you that uh, the future of the Rock of Roseville is brighter than the past, Lord. The longevity is there, Lord, and I thank you for that. Uh, I just ask your blessing, Lord, upon uh, the leaders here, the people here, ones that haven't even come yet. There'll be people coming next week and the week after saying, man, I've been looking for this church, and wow, I was greeted, loved, and cared for, and Lord, it, it goes on and on, and uh, it all came from you. You're the author, you're the finisher. We give you every drop, every speck, every ounce of glory in Jesus' name, Lord. Thank you for my friend Bob, Lord. He is a good man. I love him. You know, Bob and I have never had a fight. He's actually had a harder time with you guys than he's ever had with me. Seriously, Bob and I have never had a disagreement in 30-plus years, which is amazing. I just say, yes, dear, and it's all good. No, any kidding. It's a little joke, a little joke there. Anyway, that's it. Love you, Bob. Love you, buddy. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Francis. Good stuff. All right, we have leaders that want to pray for you, no matter what season you're in. Man, if you're in a hard place, get on up here, get some prayer for hope, help, and healing. Love you. Have a great rest of the weekend.